Thank you, Luca. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, all right, let's do it after this thorough introduction. I need to try and not be in the way of the projector. It's going to be hard because I like woggle around a lot. But to start things, hi. Uh, I am Petya, Luca already said. Um, in short, I, I work a lot and I do a lot of things. Uh, I am a project manager for a company called Human Made who does enterprise WordPress development. We are an, an agency and a product company that um, works for clients, big enterprise, cli enterprise clients, big media, but also creates their own products. I'm also a WordPress contributor. Uh, I'm involved with the Polyglots team and with the community team. I help translate WordPress to Bulgarian and I also help all the other translators from all over the world get started, keep going, localize WordPress, bring it to more people. It's something that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, I also have the privilege to be a lead organizer of WordCamp Europe this year alongside 20 other amazing, amazing people, including Sartoni. <laughs> um, and um, if you have a ticket for WordCamp Europe, we'll see you then. Uh, and if you don't, uh, it's sold out, so sorry, next year. Yeah. Um, all right. So about 14 months ago, like a year ago, but 14 months ago, I became location independent, which means I started working for a distributed company. I got hired by Human Made, and I uh, became a part of a company that employs 30 people in three comp in three, what? Micro up? Yeah? Do you hear me OK now? OK. So 30 people all over the world, clients all over the world, all completely remote. We don't have an office uh, anywhere. So that means that we are able to work from anywhere. And in the past 14 months, this is what happened to me. Uh, I've been to 21. I've worked from 21 countries. I gave 12 conference talks. I've been in three continents. I launched nine projects with Human Made. And uh, I organized four events, including uh, WordPress events and community events. And I sent, as of this morning, 100,023,324, whatever, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that number of messages on Slack. And uh, for the last 14 months, I've been thinking about what, what is remote working and what my takeaways are from the past, from the past year. And there's one thing that I realized. It's like it was an epiphany that came uh, to me uh, about oh, two weeks ago. And this is my like, the biggest takeaway. And it's this one. Like, my mom makes the best, the best chicken soup in the whole world. It's like there's n no chicken soup in the whole world that can match my mom. <laughs> It's like, sorry, I know, uh, you, you probably think it's stupid and like I'm failing and, uh, and you know, this, is, this talk is completely useless. I, I will actually, a, apart from that, I will actually try and like share a couple of things about communication in a remote environment and also productivity and happiness because like that's what everybody assumes remote working is, being able to work from everywhere, making up your own hours, right? Like why, why not be happy? <laughs> So let's start with communication and the first takeaway. When communicating online, this is like the bottom line, always. Set expectations about what you're going to do in writing and then meet them. If you're not good at setting expectations, get better because if you're not setting expectations right, you're going to fail at remote working. In a remote environment, we exchange the office with a lot of tools. We use Slack and uh, different chat channels for live communication. We use Zoom and Skype for video calls. We use uh, Trello as one of the tools that we use to keep track of projects and clients. And uh, asynchronous communication is a very, very important thing. But um, communication, they say, in a remote environment is an oxygen. And too much oxygen. <laughs> as well as too little, can also kill you. So you have to be careful about not overdoing everything uh, when communicating online. Um, I know I'm being a little vague, and uh, hopefully I can get a little, in a little detail, but I don't have much time, so I'll go through this. And if you have specific questions, ask me later. Too much oxygen can kill you, mean that 
over communicating in a remote environment can also mean burning out and also mean you not getting away from your computer for 20 plus hours. Uh, before I get back to that, I'm going to talk a little bit about written communication. And, you know, when you're not in person with, uh, or like when you're not face to face with the person that you want to that you want to talk to, there are a lot of things that get uh, missed, you know? There is just the written communication, the language, and sometimes people, people have uh, different backgrounds and uh, they have different, different levels on, of you know, mastery of the language. So in written communication, especially across multicultural environments, this is what I always do. Whatever somebody tells you, whatever way they tell it to you, always assume they mean no harm. They are being aggressive, they are being passive aggressive, something they said is offending you. It's probably not what you're thinking. Assumptions are very, very wrong in a remote environment when communicating in writing. So what I always try to do is strip all of the words that seem harmful or offensive to me and try to get what this person is trying, trying to say, you know? Just strip all the context, all the cultural kind of biases, and try to think, what is this person saying? I have a problem, I cannot do this. You know, even if uh, you, you assume by what they're saying, they're saying, it's your fault that I cannot do this. What they are actually saying is, I cannot do this, help me. It's almost never personal. It's almost never about you. It's always about their frustration and their uh, inability to accomplish something and you being one of the, one of the obstacles, you know? It's, nev it's not personal. Don't take it personal. And when in doubt, this is the rule of thumb. Just be nice. There's one universal language and it's kindness. Kindness is, as a facial expression can be seen, but kindness in writing needs to be specifically expressed. It needs to be there, visible. Thank instead of, like, ask instead of demanding, for example. Uh, ask for more clarification. If you're not absolutely sure a person means what they mean, put your assumption in writing and then finish the sentence with correct, question mark. If they confirm, that's what they meant. If they don't, you keep going until you understand what the other person means and what they're saying. And this is something I've been working on for 33 years. <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously. You, you're usually getting offended because you're thinking, oh, I put so much work into this, I spent so many hours, and what is this person now doing? Like, they're telling me that this is not enough, and like, I'm, you know, it's my fault something, something is happening or something like that. No, oh, you're just one person like the other person on the other side of the, com on, on, a, on a computer. Don't, don't think about what you've done and what you deserve and what you don't deserve. Think about the end goal. This person is trying to tell you something. Try to understand what it is. Rule number one in a remote environment. Document everything. In human -made, at Human Made, we use uh, internal blogs for literally everything that goes on in client projects and in products. We need to um, document every meeting, we need to have notes from every call, everything that develops on a project gets put into writing, otherwise somebody along the line will miss it. Somebody will miss that something happened on a project. And we use a tool called P2, and P2 is, <laughs> P2 is like a blog that you can write on from the you know, front end, and P2 is religion. It's like, you know, it's a state of mind. It's a way of life. So you forgot to take note of that last meeting in a remote environment? That's failure. <laughs> All right. Productivity. There's a lot to be said here. I can talk for two hours about how to be productive in a remote environment, but it comes down to this. Choose your battles. Set goals, there's always a lot to do. There's always a lot to do. Choose your battles, set goals the night before or in the morning, and then stick to them. Stick to those goals. If something urgent pops up, and in a remote environment, something urgent always pops up, just exchange one thing with the other. Don't just add it to the queue. 
but choose your battles and uh, and stick and stick to the goals that you set. Otherwise, your productivity will go will go to hell, and you will eventually uh, fail at whatever you're doing. You will not do it well or do it in a in a way that doesn't make you happy. And then learn what you're like. Try to monitor yourself and optimize your processes. This is a tool called Rescue Time that I use to monitor all the websites and all the tools that I use on my on my day-to-day -day basis. And what I do is I set categories, as and some categories as productive and other categories as less productive. For example, my development work, my presentation writing, and uh, and different tools that require that are set as very productive. And there are other activities like Slack, for example. Sometimes it's very productive because my role is to communicate, but sometimes it's not that productive because it's also a distraction. And um, I iterate my categories and change uh, what, what is productive and, and less productive on a weekly basis so that I can then go back and see how my day went. How my, how, how my day went sorry. Um, and I can see that I spent a lot of time on social media or I spent a lot of time, a lot more time on Slack than I anticipated. There are ways to set goals and it's like a great thing and a great tool you can use to iterate on your process so that you can be more productive. And then in a remote company, always be prepared for offline. There's go it's going to happen. Uh, Wi-Fi will fail somewhere, your 3G card in a foreign country won't work. Be prepared for offline, Be, have tasks in mind that you can do while you're not connected to the internet. Even if, you know, if you're a developer, you can sync up uh, GitHub and work on your local uh, environment. If you're a writer or a marketer, you can work on strategy and planning. There's always something to do. Never let um, obstacles be in the way of you working. It's just otherwise, if you're traveling, <laughs> if you're traveling all the time, there's always going to be something. You'll you'll be in a car, you'll be uh, you'll get car sick or something like that. Plan for these things. Plan for complete work hours, like at least five or six productive hours a day, even if you're going to be in transit. Otherwise, you'll fail. <laughs> And last but not least, remote working is not the is is, is not like the is not what you you imagine. Um, if you work in a remote a remote environment, you you probably know that there are several very 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 big issues. Um, one of these issues is I work in a company that has employees in three continents. This means that when the UK goes to bed, Australia comes online. And sometimes I have projects with clients that are in Europe, but with Australian developers. And sometimes I have projects with clients that are in Canada with European developers. And that means that if I don't force myself to stop, I can literally work 20 hours because there's always going to be something to do. And this is a huge problem in remote environment that needs addressing very, very uh, strictly. Otherwise, it gets overlooked. And what happens in Human Made a lot, and we're trying to fight it right now, is people get, like, not intentionally, you just get pulled into it. You just work too much. And burnout is real, it's, and it's a real problem because it affects productivity. After 10 hours in front of the computer, even if you have to do something, your productivity levels are al already, like, at a 50%. So it's not good for you, it's not good for the company. And uh, it has to be taken seriously. Even if we laugh about it, it has to be taken seriously. Uh, in Human Made, we make sure we take enough holiday, and also like we, we share our travel plans, and we make sure that th they don't interfere with anyone else's. And remote doesn't mean necessarily working uh, alone. What we usually do is just get together often, plan it. It's not on company time, it's not, you know, there are enough conferences, there are enough places you can go where you can uh, meet your colleagues, meet other people. And uh, we did it last year, it was great. Called it HM Road Trip. We went to four work camps, uh, passed through seven countries in one car, four colleagues, there are people coming and going. It was really, really fun. And uh, we also get, got a chance to give back to the community, which 
was like an additional, an additional perk. So there are two things about location independence. There's a myth and there's the reality. The myth is this, you know, you're all, all, you know, all over the world, amazing places, taking photos, you know, just enjoying yourself. The reality is that you have to be badass, hard at work all the time and be very motivated and very disciplined to make it work. Otherwise, you'll fail. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, to sum up and go back to my big takeaway from the last 14 months, the best thing about being able to work from anywhere is eventually going home. You just appreciate it on a whole different level. You know, your mom's chicken soup as. as as well as the long beach walks uh, in, in Thailand. So, yeah, it's about it. Thank you. We have time for one question, which I'm not going to ask because I'm a polite person. I'm kidding. I just, I'm just happy to be the fail guy because I'm good at that. That's the question there. I need to take a picture of that. I will. Hi. I was wondering, what's your take on what it's like to be location independent when you have a family? Because uh, this has been something on my mind for quite some time. I have two kids and they're growing up and we're actually thinking of becoming location independent, but because of their ties to schools and their community and so on, do you think that's feasible or do you think that location independence is actually limited to a childless, I don't know? I think the way I do it, it's probably better to not have kids because uh, you're going to get killed by your partner or whoever you're raising your kids with. But I can give you two examples of uh, colleagues and friends of mine that are doing location independence in their own way with families. Um, one, is, uh, one couple is actually traveling along with their kid. Uh, so it, he's, he's very little still, so until they start school, it's actually easier. But then the, the more interesting thing is what my friend Paolo does where he moves his family every few years to a new location. And uh, he, it, it's beautiful. Like he said to me once, when my kids are 18, they will have lived in five different countries. They will speak four different languages. And this is my legacy to them. You know, this is, this is what I can give them that, uh, you know, no, no school can teach them. They will be able to appreciate uh, differences between cultures, they will have left in different ones, being integrated into ones. So, um, if you think about it, like just, uh, yeah, maybe moving around every year or so is not ideal, but it's doable and there are people doing it um, just because they're dedicated to kind of bringing um, that kind of legacy to, to their kids. And he is location independent, his wife doesn't work. But uh, they still manage to spend time together, and they move around. They've been to a lot of places. So this is a way that you can do it with a family, I, I believe. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh